Welcome to The Brave Place, where we journey into the lives of brave men and women who have beat the odds or who are in the trenches right now. Difference makers who have truly discovered the warrior that lives within and are living it out. This is the place that will inspire, encourage, enlighten, and challenge that brave person that lives deep down within all of us. Welcome back to The Brave Place. I'm your host, Christy Rodriguez. I'm here again with Becky Schaefer of Saving Grace out of Rogers, Arkansas. We had such an amazing conversation last time in part one of this interview, exploring Becky's life and all the ways God has taken a woman who growing up had all the odds stacked against her living in extreme poverty, the victim of abuse in many forms, neglect, absent parents, problems with the law, and more. Yet God has taken every bit of it and brought so much healing into her life and is now using it to impact countless lives for generations to come within her community and beyond. And just when you think Becky's story can't get any better or braver, it does. And that's where we begin today. We'll chat a bit about Becky's marriage at first. And then we'll be diving into the God-sized dream that Becky had in her heart, a dream that parallels her upbringing where circumstances seemed impossible to break through, yet God doing what he does showed up once again and is continuing to be faithful in Becky's life. And I can tell you, he can absolutely do the same in your life. So if you have a dream in your heart, and you need that extra dose of hope today, please stick around because you will no doubt be encouraged after today's podcast. Becky Schaefer, welcome back to The Brave Place. Thank you, Christy. It's so good to be here with you today. Well, it's an honor to have you. So let's just dive right in. Let's talk about you and your husband as a married couple. Mm -hmm. Um, were there struggles there because of your past? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. I mean, just in so many ways, you know, our physical relationship, uh, there were difficulties there because of my having been sexually abused. There's difficulty because, you know, on my side of the family, in my life, when people fought, that was the, that was the end, you know, people didn't stay together in my, in my family. And so the first time we had a fight, I thought, yeah, this stinks. We're, we're all done. Yeah. Um, and that wasn't the case, you know? Um, but I also think I thought I brought all these, all this bad baggage to our, our marriage when he also brought his own baggage to our marriage, you know, but I wanted to carry it all and it all be my fault that things weren't working at times. And so, yeah, we've had to work hard to stay together. We've had to work hard to move past very big obstacles in our relationship. Did y'all have dreams together as a couple? You know, um, probably not early on cause we were surviving. Uh, but, but when we had been married for, um, gosh, I don't know, maybe 15 years or so. We, we had been foster parents for a long time before we moved to Northwest Arkansas and we were house parents at a children's home. You know, for us, that was full-time ministry. We loved being with those girls. We, we felt it was a calling. We felt God equipped us, but there was more and I didn't know it for a long time. Um, but one of the things that we saw because I aged out, we also saw the girls in our care aging out, so to speak, or they were going home and it was still so dysfunctional. And I, I felt like all we were doing was put a, putting a bandaid on a situation hmm. and that was just a festering wound that that needed much more than a bandaid. There's a little bit that's changed in the last 10 years, but for the most part, when they age out, they're, they're on their own. They're, and we think as a society, we think, oh, they're 18. They're, they're going to be fine. Get them out. They're adults. They can go get jobs and blah, blah, blah. But they grew up in poverty and poverty. You don't work. You, you are in the system. I think it's, um, 80% of all kids that age out are in, back in the system within a year after they leave. That's a nationwide statistic. And that is in the way of going, uh, boys are going to jail. Girls are getting pregnant and getting on the system, getting, getting on welfare, um, and food stamps and some things like that. And so there's a time and a place for those things. So I don't want to miss I don't want anybody listening misunderstand. If you're on a support of any kind, don't get off of it. (laughs) Stay on it. Do what you need to do to take care of your family. But there's a time and a place for that. And so um, when it comes to the kids aging out, though, there there are so little things in place to actually help them. The government has tried to put systems in place in the last 10 years. But I believe with all my heart, God did not call the government to take care of widows and orphans. He called Mm. you and me. Mm. He called our communities, our churches to do that. And so when we started kind of digging and looking into this, we realize that these kids are aging out like 
by the hundreds every year across the nation, and they're ending up homeless within the first year that they're out of the system. Mm. There's another statistic that I heard one time at a child care conference with DHS that said, on average, uh, children up to 24 years old return home to live six times before their 24th birthday. Six times. So if you think about kids that are aging out, they don't have those critical supports. In fact, we talk at Saving Grace about them being orphaned by critical supports. Who do you call when you can't make your rent? Who do you call when you've gotten yourself into a little bit of financial trouble and your or your car got hit? You know, my daughter's car got hit the other day while it was sitting in front of her house. <laughs> Somebody oh my hit goodness. it, you know, and it's like, so what do you do? You call, you make sure mom, dad, you know, help me to think, you know, think this through because I'm in a panic right now. So they're orphaned by those critical supports. And we just saw that over and over with the girls that were in our care, even though we wanted to be able to support them. As soon as they got out of our care, we got more kids. And, mm-hmm. you know, you know, the ones that are in front of you causing, you know, that are struggling, that are frustrated, who are angry, and you're dealing with all of those emotions, those those are the ones you're thinking about. You're not thinking about the one you just took to college or the one you just took back home to, to be with their family who seems to have, have gotten it together. Mm-hmm. Um, so many girls within the first year of aging out are pregnant. And, and boys will say, at least a girl can have a baby. And then she gets oh, back in the system. That's her. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And so there's just a, it's just a really a janked up situation. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, several years ago, we started going, okay, what can we do? And what has God equipped us to do for these, for the, for girls in particular? And um, that's when he just started planting those seeds in our heart to do something like we're doing with Saving Grace. One of the coolest parts of your story, I think, is that time, it's been about 10 years ago, you and your husband, you've got this dream in your hearts to help kids who have aged out of the foster system. And he's a recruiter at a local college. You are staying home, taking care of Mm -hmm. the kids, but you you also have a part-time job Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he meets you for coffee. Yes. And, um, my husband and I had gotten the kids off to school. We were sitting in our living room, just having coffee, just spending some time together. And he, my husband is a realist. Um, he is good looking, but he is a realist. (laughs) Okay. And I am a rainbow chaser. I am like, I am totally God's grateful girl. When I say say that, I mean that with every fabric of my being. Um, I stand on his promises and believe he can do anything but fail. That's the only thing he cannot do is fail. And I was just like, what about this thing? What about saving grace? We said we were going to do this. And we'd really kind of talked about it over the last few months and put in like we had called and tried to do sort of a study to see if it was even needed in Northwest Arkansas. And, and that's because my realist husband said to do that. And so that's what I did. (laughs) I called and talked to DHS and other nonprofits that kind of were doing some similar work and everybody was so encouraging and said, you know, you got to do this. And so I just said, I want to do the same. And he said, well, it's going to take like five years just to get it off the ground. We don't, we don't have anything. We didn't have, this was in January of 2009. We had zero. We had, we had zero money. We had a little bit of savings and a little bit of like uh, retirement. Cause he, my husband, the realist insisted a long time ago that we start putting money, money in retirement. And, um, So I uh, was very teary and just said, and I don't cry easily. And so I'm like, can't we just pray and ask God for a sign that if this is what we're supposed to do, that you'll, he'll just provide this direction for us. So my husband said, okay. And my husband, the realist really stuck his tongue in his cheek and prayed and asked God, you know, Lord, whatever. Um, can you please send a sign for Becky if this is really, and he did it much sweeter than that, but, Mm -hmm. but it's like, he said, God, if this is what you believe Becky is supposed to do, would you please send a sign to show us and give us some direction? And so we went to, went on to work and I was just still a little bit kind of feeling sorry for myself and, uh, went in and cut fabric for my first customer. We started talking about what we had done in our lives and where we had worked. And I told her I wanted to do this thing called Saving Grace. And this is, you know, this is for girls that are aging out of foster care or homeless in Northwest Arkansas. And I want to do this thing where I have a program where they actually come and live there. And I was telling her all about it. And she was just like, you have got to do this. So she starts writing down names and numbers of all these people that I need to contact to get help, to get started. I've got to, you know, get incorporated. I've got to get a 501c3. I didn't even know what any of that meant. Mm -hmm. Truly, I didn't. Mm -hmm. And so um, 
I felt like she gave me such encouragement. And this was at nine o'clock in the morning. I felt so encouraged. She left. I just praised God and was just like, Lord, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this encouragement and this direction and this sign that, that I should do this. You know, I felt so encouraged. And so I went on to, to a few hours later, went on my break and went on my lunch break and was in the break room. And here she comes in the break room. And I'm like, because remember I told you earlier I'm ADD. I stood up and was like, I am so sorry. I don't know what I did, but I will fix it right now. <laughs> and she said, no, you didn't do anything wrong. Sit down. She's such a gentle person. She was so quiet and just said, sit down for a minute. I want to tell you something. And I said, okay. And she said, I went to another store and was doing some shopping for more centerpiece stuff. And she said, um, I saw this and I made somebody get a ladder and get it down because I felt the Holy Spirit prompting me that I was supposed to bring this to you. And she pulled, um, uh, she had it sort of hidden behind her and pulled out a sign that was four foot long that said amazing grace. Mm. And so she had no idea. I did not share with her that my husband and I prayed together and sort of argued a little bit that morning over that. And, um, it, it was, be- it was a beautiful moment. And I, as soon as I could clock out that day, I went and took it to my husband's job and showed it to him. He cried and God put blinders on him Mm. because the realists have a hard, hard, hard time there. They see all they get up at a bird's eye view and go, there's a hole, there's a hole, there's a hole. Mm -hmm. And they start Mm -hmm. punching holes in your theories and your dreams. So there was a shift there in his heart. Yes, for sure. And the Lord just put holy blinders on him so that he could, he had to do some pieces of this to get it Mm -hmm. going Mm -hmm. that I couldn't do. I wasn't capable of doing. Mm -hmm. Um, And with it, that was in January of 2009, uh, 2009. So it's been 10 years ago. Um, and then within nine, 10 months later, we were ready to open fully funded. Tell me, tell me about that day you were sitting on the cooler. So, um, that was just a wild day. <laughs> There's a lot of cooler. This this was in the beginning (laughs) where you're just like, where are we going to get the money to do anything? This, this was, uh, there were a lot of cooler moments, but, um, or, you know, around the cooler, I guess too. (laughs) But, um, in, so fast forward to July, mid July, we had a lot of things happen. Um, the one week in July, we, uh, were on the news twice. They had, did special stories about us. We got our 501c3 in the mail. That was really awesome. And then, um, we signed a 10 year lease for the building we're in and it's about, uh, you know, right now I think it's about 63,000 for the lease for the building, um, per year. And, um, the Lord put blinders on our board too, because they signed a 10 year lease with $1,500 in the bank. Oh my goodness. But God did so many things leading up to that. We knew he wasn't playing around. Mm. And so we just decided, and the Jones trust had decided to give us the first year's lease for a dollar a square foot. Oh my so goodness. we knew we could do the first year. If we had to put it on our credit card. We knew we could do the first year, but God would hadn't have none of that. So we haven't been in debt at all since we've been open. Incredible. Yeah. And so, um, we signed a 10 year lease. They came and did a little article in the paper about us and they said they would let us know when it was coming out. Well, fast forward six weeks, the first weekend in September, um, we're putting it's first time we got possession of the building. They'd already been doing renovations. So we're painting and, and that kind of stuff. And, um, I get a call from somebody, um, and her name was Pauline and, um, I'm talking to her and I'm like, Hey, Miss Pauline. Cause that's how I talk to everybody. I'm like, we're best friends. And, um, she asked, she said, I read about you in the paper today. And I was like, I didn't know we we're in the paper. And she goes, Oh honey, you're on the front p- page. <laughs> And I was like, that is so cool. And like, literally the front page. And so I said, uh, you know, thank you for calling and being interested. She said, I want to get involved. And I told her that she could paint or, you know, we were cleaning and she said, I don't want to paint. And, um, (laughs) she felt like she was too old to do that, but she said, I'll make beds and stuff when it's time for you to make beds for those girls to come in. And I said, okay. And she said, how are you raising this money? the $60,000. Cause when the article was written, we had $1,500 in the bank. And I said, we needed 60 to open at that time, at that time. And so, um, I said, just asking people to give monthly, 
at, you know, 10, 20, $30 a month. And she said, well, you can count on me for 50. And I was like, thank you so much, Miss Pauline. That is so gracious and generous. I don't think we have anybody giving that much right now. And, um, I said, do you want to do that in like a $50 a month auto draft? We just started, we have that capability now. And she said, Oh honey, I don't mean $50 a month. I mean, (laughs) $50,000. And And I had a group of people that were there. And so they were painting and doing some stuff with us. And so we stopped and just praised God when that happened. Um, But then later, so this was a couple of days later, um, we were at an event with some people from the community and they were all like, how did you get, you know, Pauline's, you know, to give you money? And, and I'm like the Lord. And they said, well, how did you get, who's your press agent? How did you get such a great article in the paper? And I'm like the Lord, because I don't (laughs) know. Know anybody. The Lord is my press yeah. agent. <laughs> I mean, God has done all this stuff. And I said, we don't, I don't know anybody. So it's totally God. Mm-hmm. Well, then I had people at that same event kind of pull me aside and say, you really need to stop it with the whole God thing. Cause it's turning people off and, wow. you know, and people yeah. aren't going to give you money and it hurt my soul. I mm-hmm. cried. I cried. Mm-hmm. And my husband and I went home that night. And, um, so this was on a Monday or Tuesday of the next week. And, and I went home and cried and my husband wanted to know what he could do to help me. And I just said, I just need some time by myself. And I, sometimes when I get all sad and pathetic before the Lord, I just like have my Bible open, but I don't really read it. Mm-hmm. And I know he's just like stroking my hair going, it's going to be okay. <laughs> he rolls his eyes every once in a while, but he, I'm just, sta- I'm just sitting on my bed kind of crying and doing this. And my husband comes back in and has his, his, Bible and reads the passage about that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And then he said, babe, he also owns all the hills. So we don't need their money if they don't want us, if they want us to stop it with the whole God thing, we don't need, he, he doesn't, he doesn't need their money. He already has the money for us. Mm. And so the next day, that's a good man. Yes, he is a good man. And when he reads the Bible, Ooh, Ooh. <laughs> Oh, man. You're like, he so is, after he this, is later, <laughs> yeah. later. He is so cute. But when he's got the Bible and he's reading the word. Ooh. Um, anyway, the like the next day I went to um, back to the Saving Grace to the old convent to open up the door for volunteers that day. Had a meeting um, with Holly that day. Mm-hmm. And um, there was a couple that came to the door. And they had a picture, and I don't even know if I'd seen it in the paper of me in the front page of the paper, which is hilarious. But anyway, they said, we want to talk to her. So they came in, they went on a tour. I'm still talking to Holly. They came back and said, can we please just talk to you for a minute? And I said, yeah, they had money that they were supposed to go on vacation with, but had gotten sick. They wanted to give saving grace. So Uh. just the day before people are going to stop it with the whole God thing. Uh And they bring in this $5,000 check. Wow. Um, And I remember sitting with Holly going, am I supposed to look at this? And she goes, you should. (laughs) And I opened it up and I was like, it's $5,000. I think I need to go tell them. Thank you. And she said, yes, go outside. So I went outside and they, we cried together. It was really beautiful. And then I went back in to continue my meeting with Holly and the FedEx man showed up and he had a $3,000 gift card from, um, Home Depot. Wow. Yeah. And it just, I mean, truly we could just tell you story after story after story, Mm -hmm. um, how God has provided. And, um, and then the girls that we serve, they're incredible. You know, they've got major grit, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. they're gutsy and they're brave. And we talk about it all the time. Just at Saving Grace, we talk about doing it afraid. There are so many things that we have to get done. There's so many mountains we need to climb, but we're going to have to do it afraid because, Mm. because it's our only choice Mm. and and we just don't shy away from it. I love that. I love that. Uh, now tell me, you know, if someone is saying, so who are these girls at Saving Grace? Like (laughs) what is Saving Grace? What Mm -hmm. is this Mm -hmm. nonprofit that you started 10 years ago? Mm -hmm. What are y'all doing? we're doing incredible things and God's doing incredible things. Uh, it, we're, we're definitely helping to change lives for generations to come, but we are also doing kingdom work. So we have, we lease an old convent. Um, it's about 8,000 square feet. Every girl has her own room. Um, we bring them in the 
program is about two years, two to three years. They're each um, connected with three women in the community. And these are these are girls that have aged out. They're 18. Aged out or they're homeless. Okay. Um, so they just, or some of them are just simply orphaned by critical support. So they've, you know, they, some of them have lived out of their car. Some of them have came, come straight from jail. Some of them have uh, decided to try to make it on their own out of aging out of foster care. And a year into it, they're going, I'm homeless. I can't do this anymore. And, you know, it truly is a brave, brave thing for them to come to this thing. They get interviewed by four women they don't know um, in this beautiful facility. It doesn't feel like a shelter. It doesn't look or smell like a shelter. It's really a home. And we want them to feel like we waited for them, Mm -hmm. that we were prepared for them to come here. Mm -hmm. They are expected to be at Life Skills once a week. They're expected to volunteer in the community. Our program is set up in such a way that they pay a little bit of rent, but their rent is based on their participation in the program so they can get it down to like 20 bucks but then they learn to budget if they don't have anything to budget for they don't learn to budget many of the girls that come in none of them have vehicles really when they first come in but they save money they get jobs they save money they pay for their own vehicle you know many of them have never their families have never had vehicles they've never had driver's license Um, many of our girls their families have never had a job So we have girls going to work for the very first time. One just got a job a few weeks ago, first in three generations to have gainful employment. Some of the things that we expect to is that they volunteer every week in the community. We want them to go to Samaritan Community Center or to Samaritan Shop or the Salvation Army. Uh, We want them to to understand that their community needs them as much as they need their community. So much of what we do within the house is community and relationship based. We want them to know what it feels like to have people that's got your back. Mm. We want them to know what it feels like to have somebody to call when you have good news or you have bad news that's going to celebrate with you or cry with you. Those are really important pieces that we try to just teach. And it's all, everything that we do is experiential. So we want them to experience everything. So, and what we do with that money, um, that all that all kind of goes into an escrow account. And what we do is when they graduate from our program, we pay their first month's rent and utility deposits. And then if they save up to $2,000, we match it. So they get all of that back. That's we don't amazing. depend on any of their money for any of our funding. Right. So the, the purpose of the money is really to teach, teach. them uh-huh. how to handle money. Right. And I love it how you are equipping and then sending them out. Mm-hmm. So if somebody wants to help with saving grace, mm-hmm. what do they need to do? Um, they can either either call our office, which is 479-636-1133, or they can go to our website at savinggracenwa.org. And it's saving grace with two G's because it's the two words put together, savinggracenwa.org. Now, um, now your counselors, are these professional yes. counselors? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We have great people in the community who are believers, who are licensed therapists, who have partnered with us. What do you see as the future mm-hmm. of Saving Grace? Mm-hmm. Right now, how many people do you house right now? How many so women? we can have up to 12. And okay. we're always full, give or take a couple. I mean, we've okay. always got a full house. So what do you see for the future of Saving Grace? Uh, We know we have to grow. We've had, um, since July, we've had 65 applicants. It's probably more than that by now. That was the last I counted. And I think the the biggest um, sort of threat, if you will, that we have is the fact that we can't bring them in right when they interview. So, and it's a threat more for them. So we are very protective of the girls that we have in the house that are already working hard in the program. And we have to protect their well-being and their momentum. Um, so we have to be careful who we bring into that setting. Sure. We really hope to eventually have a house that we can onboard girls from there. So it'd be more like, um, a therapeutic shelter living, um, where they don't have to come in and apply they can just show up and we can bring them in. We can assess, we can get them some nourishment, some counseling an assessment, um, to kind of see what they need because their needs may not be, uh, what saving grace can provide. So getting them into a situation where they're safe and they're okay. And we can take them some, you know, we can help them apply to another program. Mm -hmm. Um, but then also getting girls that are getting them in, getting them a little bit out of survival mode. You know, this is a six to nine week process where they know that when they go to sleep at night, nobody's going to hurt them. Nobody's going to mess with with them. They're getting consistent nourishment. They're getting some sunshine. They're getting some exercise and counseling and then bringing them into the main program Mm. so that they're not in that survival mode when they get there. Mm -hmm. That's so good. Well, Becky, 
I hate it. I hate that we're out of time because I just love talking to you. I think you are a walking ball of wisdom and I love hanging out with wisdom. And so, and, and I know the reason you are that is because you are soaking in the word. Mm. Um, and I just appreciate you so much. And I appreciate you being bold enough and brave enough and having the moxie to show up today and share your story and just what you're doing in the community to help other girls mm-hmm. uh, move forward in their life and have an opportunity that they would never have had if, if you hadn't listened to the voice of God and stepped forward and doing what you're doing. So I, I just appreciate you. I thank you for being with us. Thank and it, it's just been a, a delight for me. Um, so thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so, so proud to be here. And now for the final brave word and brave challenge. God has clearly been at work in Becky's life as we've witnessed dreams being fulfilled and adversity being overcome in countless ways. I know there are many of you listening that hope your God-sized dreams will be fulfilled too. Throughout this podcast, you've heard the word moxie, which means going into unchartered territory and facing life with bravery and courage. I want to remind you that you have a God on your side that has all the moxie that you could ever need to face any challenge that you're up against. He created you to do great things in his name. And let me remind you that all things that you do for God are great things. I want to share this verse with you from Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Did you catch that? God has placed a purpose in your heart and has equipped or is currently equipping you to fulfill that purpose. He did it before you were even here. He handcrafted you for specific work to do on this earth. You have certain gifts, skills, talents for specific work, and it's all for his glory. He wants to use you to impact this generation for this time and place. Here are a few questions to ponder. Do you know what you were created to do? Do you know that God has specific work for you and only you? His word tells us he does. Are you ready to start today pursuing that purpose? Are you running? from his purpose for your life? Is something holding you back? If so, what is it? Or do you already know your purpose and you're struggling to be patient as he works ahead of you preparing the way? Let me give you this five-part brave challenge that might help you find the answer to any one of those questions. Number one, make sure you have a surrendered heart. It's in the sweet spot of surrender where God is able to work in you and through you. Surrender is the foundation of God fulfilling that dream he has put in your heart. Number two, make time for God in prayer and in his word every day to seek his will in your life. That's where your dreams will align with his. And number three, write down your dream where you can see it every day and pray over that dream every day. Number four, take action and don't quit. Even on the hard days, don't quit. Many dreams are never fulfilled because someone quit. It wasn't because it was a wrong dream. It's simply because someone stopped pursuing it. And last but certainly not least, trust him. Trust him to fulfill his purposes in you. Trust him in all you do. Before we leave today, I want to share with you a quick clip from our next episode where we'll meet up with Robin Hubbard, a brave woman who has inspiring words about being in the trenches of autism, experiencing the power of God and the joy in it all. A really powerful interview. Here's a quick clip of our next episode with Robin. Check it out. He doesn't care what people think about him. He doesn't compare himself to others. Like what a good lesson that is for all of us. Mm -hmm. He never looks at a kid beside him and says and thinks, I wish I had that or I wish Mm -hmm. I looked like that or I wish I could be more like that. He doesn't care. He just is who he is and he's fine with who he is. I can't wait for you to hear that interview. It's raw. It's real. It's inspiring. Just so much good truth in it. Thank you again for joining us today at The Brave Place. And until next time, remember, when you combine a faithful heart and a faithful God, the possibilities are endless. Have a brave day. Thanks for listening to The Brave Place, part of the KLRC Podcast Network.